Well, great. Well, thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here, and thanks to the organized committee for inviting me. I'm going to try to pick up on some of the themes you just heard in MF's presentation about the notion that we're treating infection as indicated by CCC DNA and integrated fragments of virus, which is perhaps not the same thing, and we're looking at treatment outcomes. And as MF just summarized, S antigen comes from both CAMs or antivirals, and I'm going to talk about their potential role. So these are my disclosures. So I want to start, there was a, Pietro showed a slide like this for Delta, but I also want to highlight there are no novel HPV antivirals since lamivudine 25 years ago. Yes, we have tenofovir, phenamide, tenofovir, disoproxyl, furate, and antecavir, but they're essentially hitting the same target. So we haven't had scientific advances. And something I've learned as I try to solve clinical research at Johns Hopkins is there's an expression that if, it, if there were easy solutions, they would have been found already. And I think that's an important concept to think about in hepatitis B, is that there aren't easy solutions. This is a complex virus with a complex host virus interaction. And perhaps we need to think uh, about our development in timelines that are perhaps a bit different than those that we're working on. So this slide, I won't go through all the details of different antiviral mechanisms, but I'll point out on this particular image that two is where CAMs uh, potentially can work. And you'll see they work at the entry step, the disassembly step into the nucleus. I'll share with you some data that's emerging to suggest they may work here, both on RC and DLDNA. They also work on the assembly that we all know about uh, of the virus, and I'll talk a bit more about that as well. So you get the sense where the twos emerge on this slide that this is definitely a pleiotrophic potential target. That is the capsid is a pleiotrophic, has a role at many different steps in the viral life cycle. So this is a, a publication that uh, had a really nice image that talks about the CAM-As, those that produce aberrant nucleocapsids, and CAM-Es. I'll point out that most in development produce empty capsids. And then towards the end of this particular slide, it, we really focus on the potential different mechanisms of action. So the primary effect is a decrease in infectious virion shown along the top of the slide. You can measure that by HPV DNA decline in the blood. Pretty easy to measure, actually, in a time-tested endpoint in antiviral drug development. The secondary effect here is this idea that you're going to reduce the CCC DNA, that is the transcriptionally active DNA. And that can be picked up, as you just heard in an elegant presentation from MF, by measuring S antigen, although the problem there is it's not all sourced from that CCC DNA, correlated antigen, E antigen, and HPV RNA decline, although I'll comment that these also prevent the release of encapsulated pgRNA. So not all the decline in pgRNA with CAMs is actually due to a decrease in uh, CCC. So we'll talk a bit about this, but I would put aside RNA as a reliable marker of CAM activity. I'll talk about some data presented recently uh, on the idea that there is a potentially effect on HPV integration. Harry showed data suggesting that nukes over time could reduce integration effects from the antiviral effect. CAMs may do the same thing over time with antiviral effect, but they may also have a role in stopping integration at the time point of entry in the nucleus. And lastly, I'll, I'll talk briefly about a CAM-A effect where it can trigger capsid-dependent cell death. I'll start with that because this was a recent publication in hepatology that in a CAM-A, in a AVV HPV mouse model, led to these aberrant uh, capsids led to the aggregation in the hepatocyte, which triggered ISG-15 signaling and apoptosis, leading both to hepatocyte proliferation as well as loss of infected hepatocytes. So suggesting that if you were developing a CAM-A, you might get this extra effect of a immunologic response triggered in part by these aberrant uh, core proteins that are found in the liver. So that's something that I think is worth thinking about as we, think, as we walk through this, the role of an immune response in these medications.
So I'm gonna talk a little bit about FDA endpoints and about the trial that you just saw recently of the first generation CAM plus Intecavir in treatment naive patients. In a very small number of patients, 25, we're able to show a significant difference in HPV DNA decline at 24 weeks. Not challenging because the effect size of a nuke alone plus nuke plus first generation CAM was quite large. You can see the RNA along the bottom. The challenge is when it comes to guidance from the FDA for add-on superiority, HPV DNA is not recommended as the primary endpoint for add-on because it's unclear the incremental numerical benefits over sustained suppression alone. Now, I think there are places where this could be shown. You saw a study earlier that Harry presented in immune, so-called immune tolerant patients, high DNA at four years, the suppression was greater with TDF plus FTC compared to uh, monotherapy. So perhaps that's possible. They go on to say that S engine clearance is recommended. Sounds a lot like finite therapy, which creates a challenge in terms of moving forward. So I do wanna then talk about the finite therapy definition and highlight the first bullet point that sustained suppression of HPV DNA off treatment, presumably this person could stay S antigen positive with the source of that S antigen being from integrated DNA, and there's no other markers of viral replication, no DNA in the blood. And of course, there's the traditional S antigen loss with or without a seroconversion. And they go on to say that reductions are not alone, uh, in and of themselves, sufficient. So I think a couple of disappointments with first generation CAM, certainly shown here, in the triple therapy, if you will, siRNA plus nuke plus first generation CAM, in a couple of different studies, no additive benefit with respect to HBSAG decline. And in fact, in the REEF-1 study, it appeared to actually be associated with a slightly lower decline. So the first attempt, if you will, at maximum antiviral treatments, not particularly impressive in terms of what it did to S antigen. And then I wanna to turn to a, the, the other study with uh, the first generation CAM plus nuke. This one in patients who were E antigen negative that MF led and published. And I'm gonna talk both about the, uh, about the carry on study called 211, which has not yet been published, but has been presented. In this particular study, patients became DNA negative. In fact, a greater level of DNA negativity. They became RNA negative but as you can see on this figure, the S antigen level didn't really change so much. So the hypothesis was that what you've really done is depleted CCC DNA and what's, what you're detecting in the blood is S antigen from integrated pieces of virus. Now, we don't have a blood test and Chloe Teo will talk about that a bit later, but the only way to tell if that hypothesis is true was to stop. And what you can see over to the other side of this slide is on stopping therapy. Indeed, there was replication competent virus that reemerged with detectable DNA in the blood. So that bullet point that was suggested by the FDA was not achieved uh, and a failure, if you will, of first generation CAMs. Which brings me to next generation CAMs. And you saw a teaser from MF about the poster at this meeting on uh, ALG184 on other markers. But these are some data that have been presented to the public domain, no, no data from this meeting quite yet. And looking at the in vitro HPV DNA reduction, that is the potency as measured by EC50. And you can see that Vibicavir, the first generation CAM that I've been talking about, is relatively impotent compared to the uh, CAM E compounds at the top of this slide, 184 and assembly 4334, that are, appear to be much more potent. And that these in vitro data appear to be uh, borne out in uh, a 28 day experiment. And I'll just point out that this starts at 10 milligrams and goes all the way to 300 milligrams. And if you were trying to pick a dose based on the HPV effect, you might say there's really not that much to distinguish between 10 and 300. But the key is that secondary effect on replenishment of CCC DNA appears to require a higher level of drug or potency, a different EC50, if you will, for the secondary effect. 
Therefore, the 300 milligram may actually be preferred, assuming it's safe, tolerable, and can be given to patients. So this is data in the public domain looking at longer therapy, and this will be updated at this meeting. 184 plus intecavir for a period of time that is greater than 24 weeks in seven patients, the maximum of 36 weeks. And what you can see dosing at the 300 milligrams picked because of the potential on the secondary mechanism of action, if you will, you're seeing declines in hepatitis B surface antigen in these patients. And at 20, more, those dosed more than 24 weeks, four of seven had a greater than one log decline. This was not seen with the first generation uh, CAM that were studied. We did not see this type of decline in those E antigen positive patients that were treated. So E antigen positive patients are, mind you, are more likely to have CCC DNA as the primary source of their S antigen, suggesting that this antiviral effect is real, both in the primary and secondary mechanism of action. Well, I mentioned this potential effect on integration, and this is data presented at the uh, 2023 International HPV meeting from uh, scientists at Assembly. And what they looked at was the potential effect on entry into the nucleus of both the relaxed circular DNA and the duplex linear DNA entering the nucleus. And what they presented in this particular study is that the capsid disassembly step potentially could prevent integration from occurring coming from DL DNA as it enters into the cell. And they presented an in vitro model suggesting that 4334, which is a more potent second generation CAM, could reduce both RC and DL DNA. You can see in the figure, it's kind of small, but the EC50 was a little bit higher for this uh, DL DNA than it was for RC DNA. And over to the uh, the right of this slide is the uh, comparison of integration events in this in vitro model with Intecavir the first generation CAM, as well as low dose and higher dose. What you can see is they pushed up to a higher dose, there appeared to be prevention of integration. So if we combine this with data that Harry presented, that suggests that nukes over time, presumably just through their ability to prevent replication, if you were to combine a CAM plus a nuke, perhaps you can shut down replication even further. And I think it's important to recognize that even though the blood test may show HPV DNA not detected, there is likely still ongoing replication in the liver and infection of new hepatocytes. So you can shut that down and then maybe potent second generation CAMs provide a secondary effect. Now, Chloe Tio will talk later about this study that was derived from her work and that of Ashwin Balagopal at Johns Hopkins that looked at people with HIV and hepatitis B who had two liver biopsies done somewhere around three to or so years apart. And what they did interrogating the hepatocytes was to look at where the derivation of the S antigen was coming from. Was it coming from integrated? or CCC DNA, and I'll let Chloe walk through the, the science behind this um, index that is listed here. But what I wanted to point out, and MF made this point in his talk as well, that you can see S antigen declines in patients treated with nukes where CCC DNA is the primary uh, driver, if you will, of that protein in the blood. Whereas if it's integrated, not surprisingly, an antiviral drug like a CAM, like a nuke, would have no impact on the transcription of integrated DNA. So creating a model, if you will, for potent antiviral effect. So to summarize some of the things I've talked about is that potent CAMs in combination with other antivirals, despite the early disappointments with first generation CAMs, might lead to a profound reduction in transcriptionally active ccDNA. The outcome might be this bullet point that the FDA guidance has offered. That is, S antigen could continue to produce uh, as, from the integrated DNA, but not DNA in the blood. So they become DNA negative, but S antigen remains positive. And then 
I also want to point out this may take longer than 48 weeks. And I have a quote from Tony Fauci who said, you've got to understand that you don't make the timeline, the virus makes the timeline. And this is a complicated pathogen that persists in human beings their entire lives, from the time they're born all the way to the time they die in their 70s and 80s. So this is a difficult pathogen and the timeline may be different. I think this integration effect is intriguing both because of the potency of adding a CAM, second generation CAM to a nuke, but also this idea that capsid disassembly at the early steps of the life cycle also includes a viral DNA that integrates more readily into the host DNA. And if you could block that, that might be a good thing. Now, the clinical significance certainly needs to be determined. And then lastly, that doesn't preclude a role for immune modulation. This notion that we've talked about now for years of knocking the virus down and then coming in with a drug that has some immunologic activity, interferon being our old friend we love to hate but just won't go away, does have interferon, uh, does have immunologic activity and of course there are other candidates which I've listed there and uh, listing the, the notion that CAMAs may have a unique mechanism through this aberrant core protein might be an interesting thing to consider. So I'll stop there and thank you for your attention.